This is part one of an introduction to a low FODMAP diet for healthcare professionals. FODMAP stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. All four categories are short-chain carbohydrates that have been found to cause GI distress. These short-chain carbohydrates pass through the stomach and small intestine undigested, pulling fluid into the lumen of the GI tract, which results in abdominal distension and pain. This high osmotic load then moves into the colon where it is rapidly fermented by colonic bacteria. This rapid fermentation results in the production of carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and methane gas. Overall, FODMAPs are poorly absorbed, easy fer easily fermentable, and are highly osmotic. This is a short video that was created by Monash University in Australia, who have conducted an extensive amount of research regarding the FODMAP content of food. This video summarizes the effects of FODMAPs on the GI tract. Medically diagnosed irritable bowel syndrome, known as IBS, is difficult to treat and overcome in part because we still don't understand its precise cause. However, researchers at Monash University have been studying the dietary factors in food that can trigger IBS symptoms. This research has shown that the pain, discomfort and daily disruption caused by IBS is triggered by certain types of carbohydrates in food called FODMAPs. Here we can see some examples of high FODMAP foods. To understand how some foods contribute to IBS symptoms, we need to look inside the intestines where food is broken down and absorbed, zooming in to the molecular surface of the intestinal cells. We see they are covered in molecular machines that accelerate the breakdown of carbohydrates. Most carbohydrates, once broken down, can be absorbed through pumps on the surface of your cells. However, some carbohydrates are not digested or absorbed by people. The rapidly fermentable short-chain carbohydrates that can't be absorbed are called FODMAPs. The presence of FODMAPs causes water to be dragged into the small intestine. Also, because they aren't absorbed, FODMAPs travel through your gut to the large intestine. When bacteria in your large intestine get access to FODMAPs, they use them for energy to survive. The bacteria rapidly ferment FODMAPs and produce gas as a result. Excess gas production and water retention causes the intestines to expand. When the intestinal wall stretches from distension, the highly connected nerves around the intestines send signals to the brain. People with IBS have very sensitive intestines, so these signals contribute to the pain they experience. To reduce FODMAP intake and to alleviate the distension, bloating and other symptoms of IBS, Monash University have developed the low FODMAP diet. People with medically diagnosed IBS should consult a dietitian about trialling the diet. The Monash University Low FODMAP Diet app has been developed as a tool to help people with IBS manage their diet and alleviate symptoms. Contact Monash University or visit the website to find out more about the Low FODMAP Diet. The first category of FODMAPs is oligosaccharides. Fructones, fructans and galactones fall into this category. They are both difficult to digest because we lack the enzymes necessary to break them down. Notice in this list of sources that wheat, rye, and barley are considered oligosaccharides, so alternate sources of grains will need to be discussed. Also note, Legumes and lentils are also oligosaccharides, which will be important during the application process in case of cultural or vegetarian and vegan diets. Lastly, 
Lastly, inulin and fructooligosaccharides are prebiotics that fall into this category as well. They are commonly added to processed foods and would be listed under the ingredients list on a food label. The second category is disaccharides. The main source of disaccharides is lactose. Lactose is highly osmotic and rapidly fermented when not absorbed. Sources high in lactose are milk, yogurt, pudding, ice cream, cottage cheese, and soft cheeses. Aged or hard cheeses are lower in lactose. A majority of lactose sticks to the whey when it is separated from the curd. The remaining lactose in the curd is then consumed by bacteria during that aging process. However, this is highly individualized, meaning that some may tolerate aged cheeses while others may not. The third FODMAP category is monosaccharides. Fructose is a monosaccharide, which is a sugar found naturally in fruits and honey. However, it's also commonly found modified in processed foods, as we all may know as high fructose corn syrup. Natural sources high in fructose include apples, mangoes, pears, watermelon, snap peas, honey, and agave. The last FODMAP group is polyols. These molecules are too large for simple diffusion in the gut, resulting in slow absorption and a laxative effect. Sugar alcohols are considered polyols. They are commonly found in sugar-free and dyed items, and they typically end in the suffix ol, so sorbitol, xylitol, mannitol, and then there's isomol. Polyols are also found naturally in stone fruits and some vegetables. It's important to note that some foods fall into one, more than one FODMAP category. This will be important to keep in mind during the reintroduction phase. Introducing a multi-FODMAP category food will not help to determine which category is the trigger. So for example, apples here are considered high in polyols, but we also saw them on the monosaccharide slide. The overall goal of a low FODMAP diet is to reduce the amount of undigested, short-chain carbohydrates in the GI tract. This is a temporary elimination diet that reduces FODMAPs and then gradually reintroduces them to identify personal triggers. Multiple studies have shown a reduction in symptoms in individuals with IBS when following a low FODMAP diet. However, only one study so far has been conducted among the pediatric population. The efficacy in the restriction of FODMAPs was first shown in a study where 74% of the participants with IBS and fructose malabsorption showed a decrease in symptoms when fructans and fructose were reduced in the diet. At this time, a low FODMAP diet is now supported by over 30 clinical studies. A study conducted by Halmos et al. compared a low FODMAP diet for 21 days to a typical Australian diet for 21 days. Results from this study concluded that the subjects with IBS had significantly lower GI symptom scores while on the low FODMAP diet compared to the typical Australian diet. This is the first study conducted on low FODMAP diets in the pediatric population. The objective of the study was to evaluate the efficacy of a low FODMAP diet in 33 children diagnosed with Rome 3 IBS. The parameters measured were bloating, pain, nausea, stool samples, gas production via hydrogen breath test, and any alterations in microbiome. The low FODMAP diet contained a maximum of 9 grams of FODMAPs per day, while the typical American childhood diet intervention contained a maximum of 50 grams of FODMAPs per day. Participants consumed one of the interventions for 48 hours, which was then followed by a 5-day washout period where the participants returned to their normal diet. Once the 5-day washout period was completed, participants then switched to the alternate intervention. Results from the study found that participants following the low FODMAP intervention had less abdominal pain episodes per day compared to baseline. 
Eight of the participants had significant improvement on the low FODMAP diet and were considered responders to the intervention. Fifteen participants showed no improvement on either interventions and were considered non-responders. Ten of the participants improved on both diets or on the typical American childhood diet only and were considered the placebo group. Findings from the hydrogen breath test concluded breath hydrogen was lower in participants during the low FODMAP intervention when compared to the typical American childhood diet. There was no significant difference in methane production between the two interventions. The authors concluded from this study that microbiome biomarkers may predict responses to a low FODMAP diet. It was found that participants with greater sacrolytic capacity responded better to the FODMAP intervention. The authors called for further, intervent further research to confirm these findings and explore the possibilities of FODMAP individualization based on microbiome composition. Low FODMAP diet for the treatment of IBS is highly individualized, meaning one individual may be more sensitive to a category of FODMAPs compared to another. This also means a low FODMAP diet may not alleviate symptoms for all individuals. A low FODMAP diet also requires a multidisciplinary approach involving a pediatric gastroenterologist as well as a registered dietitian either that specializes in pediatrics or in low FODMAP diets. This will be discussed further in part two along with the implementation and monitoring and evaluation of low FODMAP diets.